Psst, hey you, you want to get into terrain building? Come on, everyone's doing it. Look, daddy -o, don't be a square. Oh wait, it's not a square. Hi folks, welcome to Glitter Void Gamecraft. My name is Eric and this week we're continuing the village building series with a new series within the series of the town square, the center of social and commercial transactions throughout the city. And what contact with a nefarious element or criminal informant would be complete without a chase scene or a skill challenge that involved jumping over fountains and knocking over townsfolk and kicking over carts and crates of various fruits and vegetables. So like every protagonist out for revenge, let's start at the bottom and work our way up. By which I mean let's literally start at the bottom with the square itself. The only definite plan I had going into this was that I wanted it to be a four-way intersection. Whether this was an actual intersection between roads or just a decorative patch of stonework could depend on the location. The most generic option would be to just do a rectangle and have roads end at it, but I didn't want to be too generic because that tends to just feel unfocused. At some point, you just have to start making decisions. I'd have some sort of design in the middle, some kind of stonework to differentiate the square from the roads that theoretically extended out from it. To make this more than just a decorative piece, I wanted some sort of option for a dungeon entrance. Being that this would likely be in the center of a city, that would of course have to be a sewer grate entrance of some kind. Maybe a tile that flipped over or something. While not part of this build exactly, the idea was for each of the four corners to possibly hold stalls or I could place buildings in there. Something to give this square character and suggest a larger city. Booths, carts, maybe for later builds a fountain, a notice board, or something like that. Just anything as kind of the first stop for adventurers in a city before heading to the tavern. To base the stonework on, I decided to use some chipboard. This is graphics medium chipboard that I got off of Amazon. It's basically a dense cardboard that is much thinner and not corrugated. It's a real staple of a lot of crafting projects. Since this comes in 12 inch squares, I decided that I would mark it off in a couple of segments and then use a compass to carve out the corners. Finding the center of the piece by marking the middle of each edge, I then used the compass to draw a six inch wide circle to just kind of mark out the center of all of the stonework. This was really more just planning, kind of the crafting equivalent of thinking aloud because this would just be the base and not actually hold any of this detail. Cutting out curved corners is always tricky, but especially on chipboard, it's very dense and you gotta be careful because if you put too much pressure, then you end up cutting outside of your lines and having a rough edge. This is definitely one of the situations where I would not want to be cutting towards myself or towards my hand, just in case anything pops out and the knife runs wild. Having something of a template created, I traced it out onto dollar store foam core board. This is the cheap stuff where the paper pulls off quite easily. Once this was cut out, I removed the paper from one side on pieces this large, you have to be careful that you don't just pull willy-nilly because you can introduce a lot of warping to the material. Keeping it flat on the table is best. I marked off the stonework on the corners with a mechanical pencil lead and my finger to kind of mark a arbitrary depth. I cut into the line using my X-Acto knife and then expanded them using a mechanical pencil with the lead retracted. I wanted all of this decorative detail work to be very distinct from any of the cobblestone. I also made sure when adding the brickwork to make sure that the lines extended all the way down the sides since in most cases you'd actually see that. 
stone texture was created just by rolling a ball of tin foil all over the surface to create various indentations and then carried that on over all of the surfaces, making sure to not forget any of the exposed edges as well. Using the base slash template to find the center point of the piece, I very lightly marked it on the foam with pencil and placing a small square of chipboard down so I wouldn't dig a hole into the very center, used the compass to carve out the outer and inner ring of all of the stonework. That was expanded and then the individual bricks added with an X-Acto knife. At this point, I had to commit to some sort of design, so I decided to create a sun. I used a small bead container to carve out a circle, then I expanded some lines into a radial design that felt like a sun. I figured in a world with mostly farmers, people were going to worship the sun. And here comes the most arduous task of all of this, drawing in the cobblestones. I wish I had some quick tip, some strategy for making this not a huge pain in the butt, but there wasn't. I just started in one segment, took a pencil that wasn't particularly sharp, and drew in all the cobblestones, usually taking one or two passes on each line. My biggest fear in doing these cobblestones was that I'd get to the end and feel like they were all fanned out in one direction, overlapping the same way, there was too obvious a progression from where I started and where I ended, so I made sure to skip around here and there when I was adding them. To keep the large areas from feeling too overwhelming, I would occasionally break up the larger areas by sending these little offshoots and then working within each little subsection. It took me just over two hours to carve in all of the individual cobbled stones. That's taking plenty of times for breaks to keep your hands from cramping up. This was pretty mindless work though, so I was able to put on some podcasts and just lose myself in it until finally it was finished. My original plan for the sewer entrance was to have the center of the stonework pop out or flip over or something, but it seemed like a weird thing to create a design and then have all of your fill filter through it. So I decided to try using some of the cutout corner pieces to create a separate piece. Fun little gaming history tidbit. In the 3.5 version of the Dungeon Master's Guide, there's actually a bit that talks about the prevalence of sewers in fantasy games like this and how it absolutely doesn't make any sense from a, here comes that word, historical accuracy standpoint. Even the largest cities would not have actual sewers until the Industrial Revolution. They would be lucky to even have gutters that ran in the same direction. But as the 3.5 Dungeon Master's Guide talked about, a sewer inside of a city is a very convenient low-level dungeon because the players can access it without threatening themselves too much. They don't have to go outside of the safety of the city to access this, and you can fight ratmen and cultists and wizards and whatnot that all hide out in the sewer. Since I still wanted the sewer grate to be a large circle, I figured that having it kind of overlap the gutters would be a convenient way to connect the two. This was also about the point where I realized that I wasn't going to be able to do all of this cutting with the piece already glued down. I did my best to remove it, but well, you can see how that turned out. And that's why you never throw away anything. I used the exact same methods to add the stonework to the sewer tile segment as I did on the rest of it. Marking, cutting, expanding, and then drawing in the cobblestones. Adding the stone texture to thin and fragile pieces like this can be pretty tricky. So a tip is to use the edge of a table or a book and let it hang off 
hold it in place, then you can use enough force to actually add the texture without worrying about the piece snapping. My original plan for the sewer grate was to use toothpicks, but the arbitrary size of the hole was just under the size of the toothpicks, which was going to make things a little bit awkward. So I decided to make one out of chipboard. I traced the inner ring using the compass and marked off some bars in just a random interlocking pattern. While this looked good, the prospect of having to cut out each individual hole was a rather overwhelming one. So I quickly gave up on this and decided to make the bars out of their own piece of chipboard, some sort of overlapping pattern like this. Taking great care not to cut myself, I extracted the outer rim and then I began trying to find a way to get the bars to weave together. The first set of bars was installed using super glue. Chipboard really absorbs this well and it becomes rock hard after it dries, so it's an incredibly sturdy option. Getting the second set of beams to weave in proved much more challenging. The thin strips of chipboard were an infuriating combination of fragile and stiff, and I got more glue on me than it. I decided to go with a much simpler method of just trimming the second set of beams using scissors to fit right inside of the outer rim of the sewer grate. Lots of super glue to make all of the contact points, basically a solid weld, and then I trimmed the excess length off. The ever looming threat of warping of the chipboard meant I wanted to go with a different adhesive option. I don't use this too often, but this spray adhesive is really nice because you can hit the material with it and it gives you plenty of working time, but it has far less water in it than either PVA glue or tacky glue. And there's no risk of it adding extra thickness like hot glue might. This stuff, however, is incredibly smelly. I have almost no sense of smell myself and it was practically overwhelming to work with this. So I ran outside, gave everything a quick spray and got it in place, lined everything up and then it was back outside to let everything dry. I weighted everything down and let it dry for a while and there was absolutely no warping. Then it was time for the usual base coat of Mod Podge mixed with black craft paint. A nice thing about the stonework being a single piece rather than individually laid stones is there's no gaps in between any of the stones that would let any of the moisture from the paint or base coating or glue or anything get in to reach the chipboard underneath. So that will assist in preventing warping. Slightly dampening your brush can really help the Mod Podge mixture flow and get into all of the cracks. And for something with as many cracks as a piece like this, that is incredibly helpful. I actually did the base coat in two stages, the majority of the piece and then the edges separately so that I could weigh them down while they were drying. The sewer grate got a base coat in gunmetal. I didn't actually worry too much about getting a solid coat about this because this was gonna be so grimed up that this didn't need to look like new shiny metal. I went with a slightly darker shade of gray for the base coat of all of the stone. I thought that maybe starting with a darker color would help me not have to use as much wash to darken everything down versus starting with a sort of middle of the road gray. As usual, I picked out several different colors to fill in random bits of stone as well as to deal with the mural piece in the center. I arbitrarily distanced each individual stone of the same color family as I worked my way around. And then when I hit the next color, I just kind of split the difference. By continuing the pattern of the next color down went in between all the existing stones, I had this kind of unintended effect that the first colors I laid down were sort of rare. And by the time I got to the very plain end of the spectrum, I had a whole bunch of the light gray and even more of the sort of middle gray. It kept the pattern from feeling too cookie cutter, more like they had sort of grabbed whatever they had. And there was plenty of gray rock sitting around and much less of the tan and even less of the red. I also broke with this pattern by going through and doing just a handful of rocks in a very light off-white. To bring all the colors together and start a highlight, I used a suede and gave everything a dry brush. 
for the washes, I decided to mix things up a little. With such a large area, just using one color could feel a little boring. So I used both a black and a brown one, both the homemade. I worked with both at the same time, not being careful, not cleaning my brush between. There was just a real nice mucky mess to it all. Once that had dried, I hit everything with a light gray dry brush. Things were still feeling a little bit too clean, so I made a very dark brown wash using acrylic ink. I started by just dropping it in between some of the grout lines and letting it flow where it would, like dirty water would, and also hitting those vanilla stones. But I ended up liking it so much I used it on quite a few surfaces. I wanted some real textured rust, so I mixed up some darker terracotta and dumped in a bunch of baking soda. This was globbed in all around and in some of the cracks, and then I used the terracotta by itself to do a dry brush. It was bound to show up sooner or later. There was a little bit of warping after all of that work with washes. I had a bit of a crazy idea that I wanted to try before the glue option. I just used some plain old water and sprayed the back and then weighted it down. After about 30 minutes, I took everything off and saw that it was working a little bit. I tried to introduce a little bit of bend to it since the cardboard was still damp. And then I sprayed it again and left the weight on overnight. The next morning, all of the warping was gone. The brown ink wash was so successful that I decided to make some using a green ink. This initially was a little too atomic radioactive green, so I added just a little bit of brown, not even an entire drop. Just like with the other ink wash, I mostly use this in all of the cracks, some sort of slime or refuse leaking out of the sewers to create the illusion of the sewer being much deeper than it was. I painted the interior black. You would mostly only see this between the bars of the sewer grate. Then it was outside for a coat of the matte varnish before adding the grass and water effects. I wanted to try to create a moss effect with this static grass. Really a fine turf railroad flocking would be better for this, but I did my best. I wedged some glue in between some of the holes and just dropped on some of the turf. For the water effects, I used a brush-on satin varnish. I basically just put this in between any of the cracks, especially on the sewer grate, to imply dampness. Then it was time to glue the grate on. The static grass actually looked exactly how I wanted it to, except for the color. It was way too bright for a nasty little patch of city grass, so I used a brown wash to just darken everything up. And voila, city square and sewer grate. As this is the first piece in this mini series, there's not really that much to talk about. It's the canvas upon which you build your city scene and encounter. I'm really impressed with how the warping of the base was solved with just some water. I've actually been avoiding using chipboard as much as I might otherwise because of its tendency to warp, but if it's that easy to fix, I might just use it more in the future. You know, it's not even a square. It's really more of a partially concaved irregular octagon. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, let me know in the comments below and any ideas that you have for keeping material from warping always looking for new techniques. If you found anything particularly useful, consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to the channel. It really helps me out. In the next video, I'm gonna be getting my feet wet with some new techniques, so foreshadowing. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.